really was the internal combustion engine. And so in John Holland we have the first practical warfighting submarine. John Holland's breakthrough was combining all these inventions in one practical and reliable design. His sub used the internal combustion engine for power on the surface and then switched to battery power to stealthily creep beneath the waves and attack undetected. John Holland's submarine is actually the first really modern submarine. It's remarkably fish-like in appearance. It's got a hydrodynamic hull, it's streamlined, but it is actually equipped with a dynamite gun that gives it a weapon that it can fire at a distance, a very useful thing indeed for a warship. The brilliance of Holland's design was recognized and commissioned into the U.S. Navy in 1900 as the USS Holland. It became the blueprint for all subsequent combustion engine electric subs. But a submarine with a combustion engine has an Achilles heel that compromises its greatest strength, stealth. The key liability for a diesel electric submarine is that the batteries are only really useful for about a day. After that, they've lost their charge and can no longer power the submarine. That forces a submarine to surface, giving up its advantages of concealment and run on the top of the water so that it can charge its batteries for further submerged cruising. It would be another 50 years before the problem was solved and the connection made to the next part of the submarine's family tree. The solution was developed by Nazi scientists in World War II using technology they plundered from the Netherlands. During the Second World War, the German army conquers the Netherlands and at that time the German Navy gets a very important invention known as the Schnorkel. The Schnorkel is designed to allow a submarine to draw air while submerged. It's essentially a tube that runs up from the top of the submarine into the air above with a valve on top to make sure that no water comes in. That allows the submarine's diesel engines to get some air to run the diesels and also refresh the air inside the boat, which allows the submarine to charge its batteries while submerged. Developed in secrecy, the Nazis hoped that by fitting their submarines with snorkels, they could again threaten Allied shipping and turn the tide of the war. But in the end, Nazi Germany fell before their snorkel-equipped U-boats could affect the outcome of World War II. Even so, the technology they pioneered has been an integral part of diesel-electric submarine design ever since. The development of submarine propulsion has not all been clear sailing. The history of submarines is littered with dangerous dead ends. During the Second World War, in an effort to come up with a more powerful propellant, the Germans experiment with hydrogen peroxide. As it turns out, hydrogen peroxide propulsion is a dead end. It is too volatile a mixture, and putting something that explosive inside a submarine hull is very dangerous. The instability of this dangerous chemical almost certainly destroyed the Russian submarine Kursk in a terrible accident in 2000. A hydrogen peroxide-powered torpedo exploded inside her hull, splitting it open and killing 118 submariners. Attempts were made to use steam boilers to propel submarines, but ultimately they proved unsuccessful. The steam engine had been used by several nations. The problem was that in order to dive, you had to douse the boilers, you had to remove this huge source of heat, you had to shut the intakes and outtakes, i.e. The, the funnels, and they uh, took something of the order of half an hour to dive. Clearly not a successful design. But steam power was to hold the key to the most dramatic advance in submarine propulsion and would usher in a new age. Not through cold heating a boiler, but through nuclear power. A nuclear-powered submarine uses the reactor on board to generate a great deal of heat to turn water into steam. That steam is then pressurized and pushed through turbines that provide the power both for propulsion and for lighting and air conditioning and heating on board the submarine. At the end of the 1940s, the U.S. Navy embarked on a project to shrink a nuclear reactor and put it inside the hull of a submarine. A strong, motivated team leader was needed if the project had any chance of success. Hyman Rickover was the man for the job. 
Well, Admiral Rickover truly is the father of the nuclear Navy. This man was singularly driven, had a vision, and aggressively pursued it. The fact that we were able to put a nuclear power plant in the small cramped confines of a submarine is truly an engineering marvel, and the man made it happen. Once built, Lola, as she was affectionately known, was commissioned into the U.S. Navy as USS Nautilus in 1954. And it didn't take long for Nautilus and her nuclear power plant to prove their worth. Nautilus was a major paradigm shift in submarine design, submarine operations, submarine tactics. Fleet exercise after fleet exercise, Nautilus was just uh, dominating those exercises and it really proved the tactical advantage that they provided. A diesel electric sub was slow, could only stay submerged for a few days and needed refueling. Nuke subs like Nautilus were fast, could stay under the waves for months and travel for hundreds of thousands of miles on one tank. In a warfare scenario, their advantage would be huge. Nuclear power really provided us an enormous advantage that we never had before. It basically gave the initiative back to the submarine force. Even after we conducted our initial attack, we still maintained that advantage because we could run away, disengage, and then re-engage at a moment of our choosing. With a nuclear power plant, submarines could become almost invisible. They could dive deeper and go faster than ever before. For surface ships hunting them, they'd be much harder to catch. With all the depth charges, all the mines, all the surface ships, all the aircraft in the world don't do you any good if you don't know where the submarine is and all you end up doing is killing a bunch of fish. One of the things they realized is they need to improve underwater performance and that gave rise to the Albacore, which was our first uh, experimental submarine to really study the realm of high-speed underwater maneuverability and performance. The Navy married the power plant of the Nautilus to the hull design of the Albacore and the progenitor of all modern nuclear attack boats was born and that is the Skipjack. The nuclear sub is so threatening that anyone trying to hunt it down is going to pull out all the stops. The threat posed by a submarine creates a whole series of problems for any surface navy that it's attacking. Just the mere presence of a submarine forces that fleet to fundamentally change how it's going to operate at sea, to adopt all sorts of measures designed to defeat the submarine, and to allocate forces to protect itself from those submarines while at sea. These measures designed to detect and defeat the undersea menace, sonar, radar, depth charges, and hunter-killer subs, mean that in wartime, submarine fleets are infamous for being some of the most dangerous branches of any armed forces. In World War II, the U.S. Navy lost 52 submarines and over 3,600 men. In the same war, the German submarine force suffered 75% casualties, losing 30,000 submariners and over 1,000 U-boats, making it the second most dangerous branch of any armed forces in modern warfare after the Japanese kamikaze units. Sub-killing technology began 100 years ago and ranged from the ridiculous to the sublime. In World War I, the Royal Navy turned to animals to help counter the threat. The hope was that marine mammals and birds could be trained to locate enemy submarines and alert surface ships to their presence. There were a variety of eccentric ideas as to how to deal with this. For example, uh, ships would tow a small model of a submarine which was stuffed with fish and then a propeller operated 